And this is my, my text part. This is the part of the scripture that I'm going to be speaking from. And it's from this specific account in God's word. It's not a story that was made up by men. This is an historical event that happened. And that was recorded for us in God's word so that we can, we can now go through it and read it. And there's something God spoke to me out of this that I'd like to share with us. In 2 Kings chapter 19 verses 14 to 19 it says the following. And Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread the letters before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwells between the cherubims, Thou art the God, even Thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, which, hath sent, which he hath sent him to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the king of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods, that's a small g, into the fire. For they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth might know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. Amen. So we see this account, but I want to explain to you what happened. <clears throat> Amen. And I want to read just portions of scripture, and I want to quickly explain this to you. And if you don't listen, don't worry about the kids. Kids are noisy, and it's good to have kids in God's house. And even Jesus said, let the little children come unto me. Amen. So if they make a little noise, don't worry about them. But let me explain what happens to you in this portion of scripture. And I'd like to read just portions of it, and then I'll explain it to you quickly. But listen to what it says. It starts in 2 Kings chapter 18 from verse 13. It says, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Then Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish, saying, I have done wrong. Turn away from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will pay. And the king of Assyria assessed from Hezekiah, the king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. So Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house. At that time, Hezekiah stripped gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. So what happens is the king of Assyria, a man named Sennacherib, comes in battle against Israel and against Judah. And he wipes out the whole bunch of the fortified cities. And when Hezekiah, the king of Judah, whose city is Jerusalem, sees what's happening, he sends a letter to this foreign king and says to him, I've done wrong. Tell me what you want so that we can have peace. And this foreign king says, I want this much gold and this much silver. And for Hezekiah, the king of Judah, and of Jerusalem, the city, to pay it, he strips it from God's temple. He takes it off the pillars to pay this foreign king so that he can have peace with him. Okay, then the story goes further. Then the king of Assyria sent the Tartan, the Rabrasis, and the Rabashak from Lachish with a great army against Jerusalem to King Hezekiah. And they went up and they came to Jerusalem. When they had come up, they went and stood by the aqueduct, by the upper pool, which was on the highway to the fuller's field. So Hezekiah pays for peace. The peace doesn't work. And a whole army appears on the city of Jerusalem. A whole army appears there. They wake up in the morning and there's this big army waiting for them. Okay, follow me. Now listen to what it says. When this army comes up, they send servants. The servants of the king of Assyria to speak to the servants of Hezekiah and all the people. And listen to what it says, what these servants say. Now therefore I urge you, give a pledge to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses. If you are able to put riders on them, how then will you repel one of the captains of the least of my master's servants and put your trust in Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Listen to what it says further. Then the Rabakash stood and called out with a loud voice, in Hebrew and spoke saying hear the word of the great king the king of Assyria thus says the king do not let Hezekiah deceive you for he shall not be able to deliver you from his hand nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord 
saying, The Lord shall surely deliver us. This city shall not be given into the hands of a king of Assyria. Just give me a minute. Uh, Maria, did you find it? Okay, it's in the bag that's hanging there. Okay, not a problem. Then Elikiah, the son of Helikiah, who was over the household of Sherebin the scribe, and Jonah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told Hezekiah all the words that came from the servants of the king of Assyria. Amen. Then verse 19. And so it was that the king Hezekiah heard it that he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. So he sent Elikim, who was over the household, and Shenabim the scribe, and the priests, covered in sackcloth, to Isaiah the priest, the son of Amos. And he sends them to Isaiah the priest to get an answer, to find out what they're going to do, what's going to happen, because of these people that have come against them. Isaiah says to them, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid of the words that you have heard, which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. This is God speaking. Surely I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Okay, it goes further. Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, now after the prophecies received by Hezekiah, that God says Hezekiah is going to get the victory. Now the king of Assyria sends another message after this prophecy to Hezekiah again. And he says this, Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, the king of Judah, saying, Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Look, have you heard what the king of Assyria has done to all the lands by destroying them? And shall your God deliver you? Amen. Then Hezekiah received the letters from the hand of the messengers and read it and went to the house of the Lord. Hezekiah spread those letters out before the Lord and Hezekiah prayed. There's a long prayer that you can read, but the last part he says is, O Lord, therefore, O Lord our God, I pray, save us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth might know that you are the Lord God and you alone. Amen. The title that we're talking about is Faith versus Discouragement. Amen. And in the story that we see, we see a king comes against Hezekiah and against Israel. And when he fights and destroys the other cities, Hezekiah wants peace. So he pays him off. We see that the paying him off doesn't work because that at the morning when they open up their eyes, the, circle, the city is circled by the enemies of the same king again. The buying peace didn't work. And when this king's servants come, they come with a big show, but they also come with words where they speak to the people in Hebrew, the people on the walls, and the servants of Hezekiah, and they call out with a loud voice, and they say, don't trust Hezekiah when he says, God will save you. Because the king that we serve has wiped out all the nations and all their gods and all their cities, and who are you to think that you're going to stand against our great king of Assyria, King Sennacherib? And then Hezekiah hears this, and he sends word to the prophet, Isaiah. When the servants of Hezekiah get to Isaiah and they tell him the big thing that Isaiah tells them to say, like, the, this is now a time of trouble and it's a time where the woman has come to labor but there's no power to give birth. All that Isaiah says is, tell your master, God says, that I'm going to send a whisper into the king's ears and he's going to hear of rumors of wars and he's going to get turned around and he's going to go fight somewhere else. And it happens... But after it happens, the king of Assyria, while he's fighting in another place, sends another message to, his, uh, to Hezekiah, the king Sennacherib. And he says to him, don't think God's going to save you. Don't think just because I'm busy over here that you've been spared. God's going to destroy you and the city. And then we see that Hezekiah does something different. Then he takes those letters and he goes into the temple and he prays. And he seeks God's help. Amen. So we know the story. You understand it? Okay. Now in that story I see a type and an example of discouragement versus faith and trust. Amen? And when you look at Hezekiah, Hezekiah is the same person that God sends the prophet into his palace and says to him, make your life ready, get your things in order because God is going to take you home. You're going to be sick and the sickness you have now is not going to be healed and God's taking you home. It's the same Hezekiah that we read in the Bible that he turns his face to the wall and he prays. It's always amazing to me when I saw that, I always thought to myself, it's amazing Hezekiah who was king didn't turn to the healer, he didn't turn to another prophet for a second opinion, he didn't go to the wise men, he didn't run to the healers. 
at a moment, Hezekiah, when the prophet comes in and says, God's taking you, Hezekiah doesn't look at anybody. He gets up from wherever he was sitting, maybe on his throne, maybe on his bed, and he goes and puts his face against the wall. He turns his back on wisdom and on healers and on anything the world can provide, turns his face to the wall and prays to God. He says, have I not been righteous in all my ways? Have I not served you? Have I not loved you? That Hezekiah that does that, it was always amazing to me that a man can do that. He didn't run to any help from flesh. You know why he could do that in chapter 20? We're in chapter 18 and 19 now. You know why he could do that? Because he learned something in chapter 18 and 19 that we're looking at now. He learned a lesson. And what happens in chapter 20 shows me that he learned his lesson fully. Because he didn't repeat the same pattern that we see him do in chapters 18 and 19. In chapter 20 he goes straight to God. But in chapters 18 and 19, when this enemy comes against him, I'm going to destroy you, I'm going to wipe you out. This enemy comes to discourage him. Who are you compared to me? The enemy even says to him, I read it to you, the enemy says, I will give you a thousand horses, and you won't even have enough men to put them on. You won't even have enough chariots and men to fill those thousand horses. How are you going to stand against me? Because the least of my captains in my army have more than that. That's what the king was saying to him. The king was trying to discourage him. And the pattern that you see that the first thing Hezekiah does, it's a little bit light there, but he goes to his own plans. I want to show you the development of Hezekiah. It's the development from discouragement to trust. It's the development from discouragement to faith. So the first thing we see is he sees this king wipe out all the places in Judah, all the fortified city, all of his neighbors are being destroyed. They're being wiped out. And the first thing he does is he tries to make his own plan. He never consulted God. The Bible says it. He made his own plan. This king was innocent. Hezekiah loved and served God. He was one of the kings that we read about in the book of Kings. It wasn't a horrible king who served idols. Do you know what happened just before this enemy comes against him? You know what he does? He breaks down the high places. He removes the idol worship. He breaks down the groves. Hezekiah turns the people of Judah and Jerusalem back to serving the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's doing the right thing. Don't think just because you're going to do the right thing for God that the enemy is not going to attack you. 90% of the time when you decide to really serve God and really pray and really be serious about God, that's when the attack comes. And that's the first thing I see in the story. Hezekiah just destroys the idol worship, just gets the wrong things out of Jerusalem and out of Judah. He's just turning the people back to God, and this enemy appears to attack him. This devil comes against him. And the first thing he does is he makes a mistake. He tries to bargain with the enemy. Now, you and I do the same thing sometimes, let's be honest. You hit a situation and a difficulty. Number one, I want to handle it myself. I don't go to God straight away. I don't ask the Lord, Lord, what must I do in this situation? No, I try to handle it myself. And then sometimes, now I'm going to speak for myself. Sometimes I'll first go to the doctor and I'll first buy the antibiotics. And I'll first have my first week of taking and swallowing that big pill and not getting better. And I feel worse because the painkillers are making... I've gone through a week of that rubbish and then I think to myself, you know, I never even asked God to heal me. I never even stopped and said, Lord, I'm not feeling so nice right now. Lord, you said by your stripes I'm healed. Lord, please heal me. Who's gone through that quickly? <laughs> okay. You want to do it yourself. Who's gone through a financial difficulty when a financial giant has stood up and you thought to yourself, I don't know how I'm going to do this or get through this. I've been through that. You know how many times we first say, okay, well, I can take this to the pawn shop. Maybe I can sell that. I'm not using it. You know, I'm trying to make a plan. I'm trying to, I'm trying to negotiate with my circumstance. Instead of taking, taking that circumstance straight to Jesus and saying, Lord, but you said you should supply all my needs according to your riches and glory through Christ Jesus. You said I'll never want, I'll never lack, I'll never need. You said you'll look after me. You said you'll provide for me. Why should I sell things? And I see that same pattern, he does that. And where does he strip the first place? He strips God's temple and God's house. You and I, if we are children of God and we're serving, of God, serving God, you must know the enemy is going to come against you. In some way, shape or form, there's a fight that you must fight because Paul says, I've run the race, I've fought the good fight. There was a race to run, Paul had to run it. 
There was a fight to fight and Paul had to fight it. And every Christian, we've got a race to run and a fight to fight. And sometimes when it's family, you want to back down. I don't want to get the family fighting with me. So you try and make peace there. Instead of saying, look, what you're doing is against God's will. I can't be part of it. If you guys are going to, now I'm just going to use this example. I, I can't come and sit at your bri if you guys are going to drink so much that you get drunk. So that we haven't even eaten the food yet and you're all drunk. I, I can't sit here in that environment. I'm sorry, I can't. So now I've got a choice. Am I going to do what God wants me to do? Or am I going am I, am I to give up the principles? Am I going to give up the things of God? Am I, am I going to give up what God has brought me to? The place where God has brought me to? Amen. You can't negotiate with the enemy. So the first thing we see Hezekiah do is he negotiates with the enemy. And after his negotiation, and after his gold is sent, and after his silver is paid, when they open up their eyes, there's the enemy circling the city. You can't negotiate with him because he does not care about you. He doesn't care about you. If you're not going to take your financial issues to God and say, Lord, we can't go on like this, you have to help us. If you're not going to do that, the enemy's going to keep hitting you in that same avenue of your life. Because you're still trying to do it yourself. And God wants you to give it over to Him so that He can bless you. So that you can know that it was Him that blessed you. Because as long as you're going to try and do it yourself, if you succeed in it, what is the nature of man? Look how well I've done. I've succeeded. I overcame my problems. So you'll boast in yourself. But if I boast, I boast in the Lord. He provides my needs. He supplies everything I need. So if I give that, you're going to have health problems as long as you want to keep looking after your health yourself. I want to touch on something quickly there. As long as you think the doctor is going to help you and this is going to help you and you're going to pay to be healthy. As long as you're going to keep doing that, you are consenting that God doesn't have his hand in your situation. Okay? So I'm saying, I'm going to look after myself. The doctor will care for me. I'm saying, Lord, I don't need you to heal me. That's what you're doing. Every aspect of your life. Think of anything that's going on in your life. Anything. If you're still doing it yourself... You are saying to God, thank you, no thank you. That's what you're doing. Amen. Lord, I need this. Lord, I need that. Lord, I want this. Lord, I want that. Lord, can you do this for me? Can you help me with that? I'm inviting his hand into that situation. Lord, you help me prosper at work. Lord, you give me the right person to be my wife. Lord, you give me the finances that I need. Lord, you provide for me. Here's a guy who didn't do that. And when he opened up his eyes, the enemy was still there. Because you can't pay for him to go away, he'll come back again. And as long as you leave that avenue open for the enemy to come in, the enemy is going to have charge. But if you give God the way in that aspect, God is going to have charge. Amen? The second thing that we see that he does is, when he sees his plan didn't work, he did a good thing. Now he runs to the temple, and he runs to the man of God. He runs to, you know, sometimes it's nice. When I was not where I should have been with God, it was nice for me to know that, my father did serve God. So at times you feel like your prayers are not going to be answered because you're a sinner. And you don't feel like you're right to come before God. The best thing you can do is then run to somebody you know loves and serves God. You say to them, pray for me. Pray for me. The best thing for you to do when things are not going right, when things are going terrible, don't stay away from God's house, but run to God's house. I'm telling you, I'm planning a sermon about this, but in that sermon there, God's going to take something and talk about your exact situation. Amen? Or prophecy is going to come out, it's going to be exactly for you. Or there's a song that's going to be sung, it's going to be exactly for you. You know how many times God speaks to me through songs? I had a funeral on Friday and God spoke to me through a song. That guy put that item and that song together for that funeral, but he never knew that song was for me as well. And God used that song in that funeral to talk to me about my life and my situation, about something else. And right there, God encourages me. And God encourages me with it. The worst thing you can do is stay away from God's house and stay away from God's people. Listen, even if you sin, even if you fall from grace, even if you've done wrong in God's eyes, don't stay away. Come. Come. And we see what Hezekiah does. Hezekiah goes into the temple and he sends word to the prophet. He says, go tell the prophet this is a day of trouble. Go tell the prophet to pray for us. Maybe God will hear. Amen. That's the first thing he does. And when he goes there and he sends word there, what happens? God answers. God answers through the prophet. And God says that we're going to make a way. And God says, don't worry about it. I'm going to send a wisp in his ear and I'm going to take him away from the city. Amen. And God makes a promise. He's not going to destroy you. Trust me. 
Amen. And it's amazing to me because how many times have you and I received prophecies? Quickly. Prophecy or a word from God or while you're reading a promise out of God's word. Or in a sermon like this, you know that while I'm talking, something is like specific. It's for you. know it's for you. I'm talking, but you know, hey, this is for me. How many times have we received that? Now, think about this. How many times have you received that, and directly after you've received it, the problem is still there? Or the problem gets bigger? Okay, let's be honest. We're not trying to lie about it. How many times have you received it? God's going to bless you. But for the next month, you're still sitting in financial problems. You think to yourself, what happened with that prophecy? Why hasn't it gone away? You see, this king, when, when God says, I'm going, to send a, I'm going to send a lying spirit and a rumor and a this and a that, what happens? The king pulls away and he goes and he fights somewhere else. But he hasn't forgotten about Hezekiah. You know why? I'm going to say it in Afrikaans, because the devil is lustig. It's so hond, balwurig. It's like a dog. He comes back. You chase him away, but he comes back again. You chase him away, but he comes back away. You are never going to get in the place where you are so in God's will. There was an old teaching that if you put a stone in the middle of a spinning rim, but you put it perfectly in the middle, it won't go flying off. And if you are perfectly in God's will, there's no temptation. Says who? Do you know what the Bible says? When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, you know what the Bible said? And the devil left him for a season. That wasn't Jesus' final temptation in the wilderness. A few times he said to his disciples, you're not of God, you're of the devil, why are you trying to tempt me? How many times did the Bible say that he was tempted by the Pharisees? How many, how many times do you think the enemy tried to come against Jesus? The wilderness wasn't the first time. And if Jesus was tempted all throughout his life, you and me are going to face difficulties all throughout our life. Listen, prophecy or no prophecy, it's going to happen. That's why the psalm says, the Lord prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Huh? That's what the Bible also says. Any weapon that is formed against you. What does it say? No weapon that is formed. Formed against me shall prosper. As children of God, you know what our problem is? I don't want the weapon to, to form. I don't want to even see that weapon. And when the weapon forms and the enemy appears, we think we, somehow I'm out of God's will. Somehow I'm not living like I should be. No, God says no weapon that is formed. The weapons are going to form, but it's not going to prosper. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. You're never going to get in the place in your life where you sow in the will of God that nothing touches you. No, people at work are going to be like sandpaper. They're going to rub up against you because God's going to use them to make you smooth. The taxi driver's still going to pull in front of you. Come on. You're still going to wake up to a cold morning. You're still going to have problems here and there and difficulties. And then sometimes it is going to be the devil that stands against you because he knows you're a man or a woman of God. And he wants to stop your influence on your family and your co-workers. So he's going to stand up against you because he wants to, he wants to stifle you. You know what the devil's plan is? There's two plans. God's plan is clear. God wants to use you so that you can reach others for him. To bring them to him as he used others to bring you to himself. Right? You know what the devil's plan is? To make you unusable. He wants to make you unusable. He wants to break you down, have no faith and trust and hope in God, so that you give up the holding on to the hem of his garment, that you no longer walk with him, that you no longer serve him, that you no longer speak for him, that you no longer let your love or his love that you, he's placed inside of you shine out of you to others. That's what the devil wants. The devil wants to stifle you and discourage you so much that you no longer walk with God. That you say, what is it worth to serve God? Amen? And you can't find your own way out. And when the situations do hit, don't stay away from church. Come to God's house. And the last part is this. After Hezekiah receives the prophecy, now he gets another letter. And this letter is even more direct. It says, don't think that you can trust in your God to help you. Don't think you can trust your God to help you. Because all the other gods didn't save them. And now I see the progression from a man trying to do it himself to a man running to church. Now Hezekiah does the best thing that we can do. He moves from that discouragement to faith. He goes into God's house for himself. Amen? It's beautiful, eh? Now he goes for himself. Now he doesn't send a messenger to go to the prophet. Now he's not trying to pay his way out. Now he takes the problem, those letters, and he himself goes into the temple. You know what that scripture says? And he laid the letters out before the Lord. In the temple. Now Hezekiah goes to God for himself. And he prays. And he says, Lord, see their threatenings. Look how they've 
blasphemed your name. Look at the problem I'm facing. You are the God of heaven and earth. Yes, they've destroyed the people around me. They've destroyed their gods who were no gods, but you are the maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. Help me now, Lord, please. Help me now, Lord, please. Why? So that all the people might know that thou art God. Now it's the same prayer that Elijah prays on Mount Carmel. Send fire so that these people might know that there's a God in heaven. Amen. It's that same prayer. And Hezekiah learned that. So that when the prophet came and said your time's up. Hezekiah didn't try to do it himself. He didn't send somebody to the prophet for a second opinion. He stood up and faced the wall. And said you know me Lord. You know I'm righteous. You know I love you. You know I serve you. Why this judgment upon me? The prophet wasn't even out the temple when God said, send, go back. Telling him I had him 15 years to his life. You know where he learned that? He didn't learn that in easy situations. He didn't learn that under blessing. You know where he learned to turn to God and nobody else immediately? He learned it under trial. He learned it under discouragement and he learned it under pressure. Now children of God want to grow in the spirit. I want to be a great man of God. But we don't want to be pressed. You know why coal turns into a diamond? Because it gets pressed. You know what I prayed oftentimes? I said, Lord, I'm getting pressed. I can feel it. Let me not break. But just change this man into the diamond you want him to be. Press me, but let me not break. Turn me into what you want me to be. Amen? That seed, it's got to go into the ground. It's got to shoot roots. It's got to grow. It's got to face the winds. Before it ever becomes that beautiful tree that can be climbed and a tree house can be built in. A lot of us as children of God, we want, but we don't want to go through trials. We don't want to go through testing. We don't want to go through the attack of the enemy. You know how God makes you strong in Him? You grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ more in the difficulty and the testing and the situations, more than in the blessing. It's easy to stand in the blessing and say, I praise you, Lord. It's a different thing to stand in the difficulty when nothing's going right. You've received prophecy, but they haven't been fulfilled. It's different there where you don't have enough money to pay for things. To lift your hands and say, I love you, Lord. I love you. I trust you. Very different places to stand in the valley or to stand on the mountaintop. Amen. But I thank God that Jesus is the lily of the valley. That even there in the shadow of my circumstances, that beautiful lily grows and he's with me there. I thank God that he's the rose of Sharon. You know where the rose of Sharon grew? They grew in the hardest ground. In the most difficult. It wasn't soft ground. It was hard ground. But the roses of Sharon were known to have the most beautiful scent. Amen. Jesus is the rose of Sharon as well. It's beautiful to me. If you see, if you see what comes out of the story. You can read the story. But, but God's showing us something out of it. And it's beautiful to me. Amen. Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said. Oh Lord God of Israel. The one who dwells between the cherubs. You are God. Listen, he's trying to pay his way out. He's sending other people to the prophet for him. Now, suddenly, listen to what he's saying. He's saying, you are the one who dwells between the cherub. You are God and you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, Lord, listen. See, he's, he's not trying to save himself here. He's not trying to send somebody else to speak for him here. Yeah, he's pouring out his heart to God. Yeah, he is getting busy with the one that he trusts and that he has faith in. And it ends, therefore they destroyed them, because they were the gods of men's hands. Now therefore, O Lord our God, I pray, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth might know that you are the Lord God, and you alone. Isn't it beautiful? You see the difference, how he quickly, it was a quick space in time, how God threw him in the furnace, so he could quickly go from his own plans, to sending somebody else, to himself falling before the Lord. That's beautiful, isn't it? But in the story, I see that the devil also comes against people in two ways. He comes against us and he attacks us in two ways. The first way is this. He comes with a big show. A big show. First, Hezekiah tries to pay away. Because he's seeing what this enemy is doing to the people around him. But on the morning when he opens up his eyes, Jerusalem is surrounded. Jerusalem is surrounded. From the threshing floor, it's surrounded. So they look over the wall and there's this big show. The enemy has stood up against him. Amen? The big show. The enemy comes against you with a big attack. Amen? When COVID came, it was a big show. The enemy stood up with a big show. 
to attack the children of God, to attack everybody. Amen? You know what COVID was based in? It was based in fear and discouragement. Those who said, I don't, I don't believe this thing can affect me. Me and my wife said, this is flu and we'll accept it as nothing else is flu. We both got COVID, we both got over it. It felt like flu to us. Because we didn't allow the fear to come into our hearts. Because we trusted God. Amen? The enemy comes at this. I think of Goliath. Think about what Goliath was doing when he stood against the children of Israel before David got there. He stood there and he said, give me a man to fight with me. Big show. That, he wasn't a small man. He was a big man. And what happened to the children of Israel? They were all discouraged. They were discouraged. Because day after day, that same giant stood there. Day after day, he broke down their faith. Day after day, when they woke up in the morning, they looked at him at a certain time of day, he stood up and stood in front of all of them, and said, come fight me. Come fight me. And nobody wanted to fight him. Amen? It's the same with you and me. Sometimes there's big situations in our life. You wake up on a Monday morning, it's still there. Listen, on Tuesday morning, pastor's not with you at home. You wake up and the pain is still there. Or you wake up and the bill is still there. You wake up and the children are still not saved. You wake up and the situation is still there. You wake up and things are still not better. Amen? Sometimes the enemy will come against you with that and every morning you wake up, he's there. And every morning you wake up, he's there. And I don't know how long it was, but over those days, it broke the children of Israel down. Saul didn't want to fight him. Saul was going nowhere near him. And all the children of Israel, the Bible said, they quaked and they feared every time they saw Goliath. Amen? But there's a difference when you see David come into the camp. Because David had been tucked away with God. Writing Psalms, worshipping God. When the lion came against David, the power of God was there. David destroyed the lion. When the bear came upon David, the power of God was there. David destroyed the bear. So when David walks into the camp and sees it, he's confused. Why is he confused? Because he hasn't been sitting for the three weeks that they've been sitting with the giant screaming at them. And their hearts are discouraged and broken down. They're under the discouragement. He's under the trust and the faith. And when he looks at him, he says, Who's this uncircumcised Philistine that he can challenge God and Israel? I'll fight him. Amen. You know why? Because he says, The same God that was with, the bear, with me with the bear and with me with the lion will be with me against you. He didn't allow the discouragement to come into him. He looked at him and he looked at God and said, my God's bigger. Amen? So one of the ways the enemy will come against you is a big thing. A big show. A big problem. A big circumstance. A big situation. Amen? And another way the enemy will come against us as children of God is he comes against us with a small lying voice. When you see what happened with Hezekiah and the king of Assyria, when the king of Assyria came against Hezekiah, it was a big show. He brought his whole army against the city. He didn't bring a portion. He brought everything he had. And said, who are you compared to me? Who are you compared to the bills? Who are you compared to the pain? Who are you compared to these things? Big show. But then also a small, small voice that was lying. And a small voice that was speaking discouragement. The servants of Sennacherib. Don't think Hezekiah can save you. Hezekiah's servants say to the servants of Assyria, Don't talk in Hebrew. Speak in your language. We can hear you. We don't need the people to hear as well. And what do they do? They speak louder in Hebrew to all the people on the walls. They say, don't trust Hezekiah. Don't trust your God. Don't think that he's going to help you out of this. What happens sometimes when you have that big situation? Then the enemy also comes with a little voice. Ooh, this is going to kill you. Ooh, you're never going to get out of debt. Ooh, they're going to come take your house. They're going to take this. They're going to take that. And he comes and whispers. So it's not enough for him to give the problem. He still comes with a discouraging voice afterwards. It's your fault you're in this situation. Because you're not good enough. So the situation's happening, but he's still so fail that he comes and whispers into your heart to try and break you down even more. You know why? Because in faith God wants to use you. With discouragement the devil wants to break you down so that you are not usable. Amen? When we see the children of Israel, Moses sends spies into the land. Caleb and Joshua come back saying, let's go. What happens? All the other spies come back with what? They saw the big show of the big enemy and the giants in the land. And when they come back, the devil uses them to be the little voice. Oh, we can't go into the land. The people are as giants. They're going to destroy us. 
Joshua and Caleb are saying, let's go fight. Because they're looking at God. The other spies are looking at the big show. And they're being used by the enemy as a little voice of discouragement. And their voice turns the hearts of all of that generation. So that they don't go into what God promised them. God had something for them. And they didn't get it because discouragement came into their hearts. Because they stopped looking at God and started looking at problems. Listen, it's easy to say it as I'm standing here now. It's easy for me to say to you, don't look at the problems. Look at God. But I want to tell you something. Where are you going to learn to not look at the problems and look at God? Are you going to learn it where you're blessed and highly favored every day of your life? Or are you going to learn it in the battle? I want to ask you something. Where do you think a man learned to swing a sword and lift a shield and pull a bow? Where do you think they learned to do it properly? Where do you think they learned to do it that their life depended on it? That it wasn't just practice but actually life and death situations now? Where did they learn to do that? They learned to do it in battle. You know, you have basic training but you become very good if you get put into a war. You know, God will give you the things that you need. God will give you His promises. He'll give you leading. He'll give you pastors. But you become really good at standing in faith once your faith has been tested. You become really good at fighting as a child of God for what you believe in and those you love. When? In the battle. Theory is one thing. Practice is another. Amen? But in that fight, in that battle, God will stand with you. Amen? Listen to this. Discouragement is to deprive of courage or confidence to dishearten. The enemy wants you in your Christian life, he wants to deprive you of courage or confidence in Christ and in God. He wants to dishearten you from serving God and walking with God. Listen to this, discouragement is a spirit and it comes often when you do the right things. Amen? But get little or no results. It's one of the devil's tools to make you feel bad about yourself. To hinder your progress and to stop you from being successful. Discouragement is not to be accepted at all. That's so much easier to read than it is to live, right? Come on, let's read that last sentence. Discouragement is not to be accepted at all. <laughs> it's easy for me to say it here. It's different for me on Tuesday. It's different for me on Wednesday. Amen? But on Tuesday and Wednesday, I'm not saying it. On Tuesday and Wednesday, I'm practicing it. On Thursday and Friday, when you're not there, I'm actually doing it. Lord, I don't understand, but I trust you. Lord, I don't know how, but I trust you. Lord, I, I don't know, but I trust you. I don't know how we're going to do this, but I trust you, Lord. And sometimes you've got to sing a song and you've got to encourage yourself. Never failed me yet. There's one thing I know that wherever I go, my Jesus love has never failed me yet. He's never failed me yet. And it's in the middle of that storm where you're standing and it's you and it's God and it's the enemy alone. And nobody else is helping you. Amen. Yeah, we can pray for each other. And if you put requests on the prayer group, we will pray for you and we'll intercede for you. But when you're standing in that battle, it's you. You've got to lift that shield of faith. You've got to hold the two-edged sword of the word. You've got to have the breastplate of righteousness on You've got to have the helmet of salvation. You've got to walk with the belt of truth. You've got to walk in the gospel. Amen? It's a different thing to profess the gospel or to walk in the gospel. That's why it's called a narrow gate and a straight way. It's a difficult walk for us as children of God. But the enemy is coming to discourage you. What does it help to be a child of God? What does it help to serve God if it goes like this with me? Now you're trying to avoid the battle that God is trying to use to make you to be strong. You just want to go back. You know, but look, the people in the world, they have better. Ecclesiastes speaks about it. Don't compare yourself to them because their judgment is coming. Your reward is coming as well. Be a good soldier of Christ. Endure hardship, the scripture says. Amen. And you will become stronger in Him. You know what, where the real strength comes from? It's from battle to battle when you look back and you realize, but I wasn't destroyed. But I wasn't killed. But I wasn't. But I wasn't. Then you can say, hey, but he was faithful. He was faithful again. He helped me again there. He carried me through again there. And you know what happens? Battle for battle. Where the enemy tried to discourage you, once you come out, God has increased your faith. God has increased your trust. God has increased your hope. God has increased your love. 
So what the enemy planned for your bad, God will use for your good, if you will just hold on to God in the middle of the battle. Because listen to this, if you don't get through that battle, you're just going to go back to the start of it again. Because God's trying to teach you, teach you to trust Him. And if you don't trust Him in that battle, then you've just got to go back to the start of it again. And you're going to keep sitting at that one battle the whole time until God gets you through it. You know why? Not because God wants to punish you, not because God is sadistic, but because God wants to bring you to the next level of faith and trust. And then God brings you to the next level of faith and trust. Do you, know, do you understand something? Look at David's life. First it was a lion, then it was a bear, then it was a giant, then it was a mountain full of giants, and then he wasn't even appointed king yet. Then he was put as a servant in the king's house to play for him. Then the king tried to kill him and he had to run for his life. After he's anointed to be king, he has to run for his life. The promise has come, I've called you to be king. I'm going to lift you. What happens? He runs for the next how many years? He says, well, what happened to that promise, Lord? I'm discouraged now. I'm supposed to be king and the king's trying to kill me and I'm living in caves. What's going on here? See the progression from a lion to a bear to a giant to a valley of giants to running for his life and then to being king of Israel again. So God took him from faith and trust and hope and love. God developed him. Hey, Amen. It's beautiful to me if you see it. Joseph had 13 years to wait before one dream came true. God says, your brethren are going to bow before you. I'm going to elevate you to a position of honor amongst your brethren. I'm going to lift you, God saying. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to look after you. Right after he has the dream, what happens? He's stripped of his coat and he's thrown in a pit. Was he doing anything wrong? He wasn't doing anything wrong. Was it pride? No, he just said, this is what God said to me. And it doesn't get better. From the pit, he goes to Potiphar's house. From Potiphar's house, he goes to jail. On jail, he's basically on death row before God takes him out of the jail and elevates him. 13 years he had to wait. Amen? 13 years. Do you think he was discouraged? Come on, he had to have been discouraged. Your own brothers throw you in a pit. Listen, Jesus had 12 disciples. One was a devil. <laughs> Amen? We know that. One of, one of his disciples was a devil. Amen? His brothers threw him in a pit and 13 years he had to wait. Amen? So he had to have been discouraged along the way. But we see that even through his discouragement, when Potiphar's wife says, sleep with me, he says, how shall I do such a thing to my God? And he runs away naked. Even then in the pit and in the prison, he's still praying to God and God is still giving him dreams and God is still using him. He must have encouraged himself in the Lord along the way. Amen? Look at Moses. God says, I'm going to use you to save my people. There must have been prophecies. And the prophecies must have come to Pharaoh's daughter and it must have come to Moses' wife because Moses knew he was going to do something. The Bible says it, he knew. And Moses, what does he do? The same thing Hezekiah did, he tried to do it himself. And he kills the Egyptian and he has to run away for his life. And what happens? God says, I'm going to use you to set my people free, but for 40 years he's in the backside of the desert looking after sheep. Nothing happens with, for 40 years, can you imagine? Imagine God says, I'm going to use you. I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to put my words in your mouth. You're going to reach people for me. And for 40 years you do nothing. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the discouragement that Moses must have had? But God was doing something with Moses. Before Moses runs for his life, Moses says, I can do it. The Bible says when God speaks to Moses out of the burning bush 40 years later, the Bible says there's no man ever meeker than Moses. When God comes to Moses and says, I want to use you, Moses says, I can't go, you can't use me. Can't even speak properly, Lord. Forty years before that, he was saying, I can do it myself. Look at my arm. I'm killing this Egyptian. Forty years later, God brings him to the place where he says, I can't do it. And I believe God says, now because you said you can't do it, now I will do it through you. Because before you said you could do it and I couldn't use you because of it. But now because you say you can't do it, now I'll do it through you. So that I'll get the glory from it. Amen. Sometimes God has a process and God has a plan in working with us. Sometimes your difficulties and your situations and circumstances, God's using those things to develop you and to bring you to a place that He can bless you and use you more than He's used you before. Amen? God's trying to break down your own reliance. God's trying to bring you to the place where you submit to Him that He can use you. Amen? Look at this. Caleb. Can you imagine what a man must have been like for Caleb? He's standing at the edge of the promised land. He's saying, let's go. We can do this. 
And the other spies bring a negative report and God says you won't go in. You're going to walk around in a circle in the wilderness until this generation dies because they would never listen and they would never believe. Can you imagine how it must have been for Joshua and Moses? Two people that believe God's going to do this. And for 45 years they've got to walk around in circles with a bunch of people that never believed. Can you imagine? God's going to do something. They've got faith. And the rest of the people are saying, oh, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's changing. Can you imagine what it must have felt like for those two men? Ah, oh, Lord, I'm being punished with unbelievers. I've got to walk around in circles with this mumbling, grumbling bunch who'd never believe. But it's beautiful to me when Caleb comes back. Caleb looks at Moses when they come back again and he says, I've still got the same strength now that I did 45 years ago. What does Caleb say? Give me the mountain. You know what the mountain was? The mountain was the giants. The Anakim lived there. The giants. Caleb says, give me the giants. I'll take them. I was waiting 45 years for this. Give it to me. I'm going. Tell me 45 years that man must have been discouraged along the way. He must have been like, oh, how long am I going to have to put up with these people? Moses himself said it. How long do I have to put up with these people? Imagine Joshua as well. Oh, I'm going to walk around in circles because you won't believe. But when God brings them back, Joshua goes in as the next leader and Caleb says, give me the mountain. The mountain was named after the Anakim. After Caleb is finished, you know what that mountain is called? Who knows? The mountain is called Hebron. Friendship of the Jews. Friendship. He goes in and changes the name of a place. It gets changed from, from the giants that everybody was afraid of. He changes it to friendship. If you trust God, God will take the places where your giants live. The places that discourage, the places that break down. God will take those places that have been a fight for you and turn them into a place of peace, a place of friendship. Amen? If you and I will trust God. I heard somebody once say this, and I'd like to mention it in the next slide. Jesus was in the grave for three days. I want you to just think quickly how discouraging it must have been for the disciples and for those that followed Jesus. Jesus proclaimed himself the Messiah. He proclaimed himself the Son of God. The full plan of the cross was hidden for them until after the crucifixion and after the resurrection. But think about this. Jesus dies and is put in the grave and the Holy Spirit is not yet poured out. Their Savior has been taken from them. There is no comforter because he hasn't come yet and everything is quiet. The Romans want to kill everybody that believes in Jesus. You know what faith is? Faith is the three days. When all you have is a promise, Jesus says, I shall rise again on the third day. But you have no other word from God. For, for three days, the disciples had no word. They had no prophecy. They had no comfort from the Holy Spirit. All they had was the promise of Jesus. You know what true faith is? Faith is the three days when it's quiet. Faith is believing a prophecy I heard four years ago that still hasn't come into fulfillment. You know what faith is? Faith is when I'm standing in the middle of my storm and nobody's phoning me, no prophet from the church is giving me a word, nobody's telling me anything. All I have to believe in is what God has said to me in His Word, what He's spoken to my heart, and a prophecy I received four years ago. You know, when I was trying to come out of drugs, all I had was one prophecy. God said, my name shall be called Joshua, which means the Lord is my salvation. And Lord, you said I'm going to preach the gospel. I was looking at blackness. That's the road I had in front of me. I don't know how I'm going to come out of drugs. I don't know how I'm going to get free. I don't know how I'm going to ever serve you. I don't know how I'm ever going to come right. I had no clue how to even take the next step. But all I did was on the side of my bed, go down and pray and say, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. I don't know how the situation is going to get fixed. But you said, you said the Lord is my salvation shall be my name. Joshua, the Lord is my salvation. So Lord, I need you to save me. And number two, you said I'm going to preach. So Lord, from here to the place that I preach, I don't know how I'm going to get there, but you're going to have to carry me. And I had no clue how I was going to get there. The three days, nobody was talking to me, nobody was phoning me, nobody was prophesying, nobody was encouraging me. It was quiet, but all I had was a promise. For three days, all they had was a promise. On the third day, he shall rise again. As, 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 as Jonah was three days in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. And you know what happens? The disciples didn't even believe it. Because when the woman come running to him and saying, the tomb is open, he is risen, they didn't want to believe it. Amen? That's how discouraged they were. They didn't want to believe it. You and I need to hold on to faith and hold on to trust. We mustn't be discouraged. Hezekiah takes that letter and he lays it in front of the Lord. 
See how he moves from trying to do it himself to sending other people for him. And then he himself goes. And he brings those letters before the Lord. You know where the power came from? The power came from putting all trust and hope in everything else, including himself aside, and putting his trust and his hope and his faith in God. And when he goes in, he prays. I don't want to in any way underestimate this morning the power of prayer to you. In your storm, pray. You know what happens with me? I've mentioned it sometimes. I hit the storm and I don't know what's going on and things are going crazy around me. And then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit lets me know, hey buddy, you're in a storm. Then when I realize, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, I'm in a testing, I'm in a storm. Then I realize, oh, and then I go down on my knees. I always go into a storm walking. And I thank God the Holy Spirit lets me know, hey, this is what's happening right now, Buti. Then I go down on my knees. And then in the storm I start to give everything over to Christ. Lord, if I sinned, if I've done something to bring this upon myself, show me. Let me repent of this. Let me repent of it, I want to get right with you. Then after I've gotten right and I make sure there's nothing in my life that has caused this, then I get busy with God. Okay, Lord, I trust you in this situation. I don't know what's going on here, I don't know why this is happening, Lord, but I trust you. I always go into a storm standing. I always come out of it kneeling. And if I don't come out of it kneeling, I just get pushed back into the start of it again. And God brings me to that place. And then, then when I come out of it, I get to a higher ground. Then when I hit that same storm again, it's not a problem for me because I've dealt with a lion before. I know how to deal with a lion. I just pray and I see God. But then God takes me to a bear. And I go in walking and in the middle of the storm, I realize I'm in a storm and I hit my knees and I say, Lord, I need you. And God takes me through the bear. Now I know how to deal with a bear and I know how to deal with a lion, but God puts me in front of a giant. Ah, oh, Lord. Go in walking into the situation and I know, what's going on here? And the Holy Spirit says, ah, you're in a storm, booty. And I go down on my knees again. Boom, Lord. And God takes me through the giant. And then it's the valley of giants. And then it's a kingship. And then it's the next. And all of that, God's developing me. All of it the devil's trying to do is discourage me because he wants to make me unusable. All of it, God's trying to use it to make me humble before him. So I can just come, Lord, I'm not going to do this on my own. If you don't help me, Lord, this is not going to work. But I'm coming to you because you can fix anything. You can fix anything, Lord. So I'm coming to you and I'm just going to ask you, fix what cannot be fixed. Lord, you fix it. You make it right, Lord. And I'm trusting you. Because I'm, I'm looking at blackness. I can't see the road ahead of me. I don't even know how this is going to get fixed. But I know that you can fix anything. And I trust you, Lord. Please help me. And Hezekiah goes down and he prays. I hope I get this right. Amen. The Bible says... If the person that blows the trumpet doesn't make a clear sound, how shall it be known what is trumpet? When the enemy comes up for war and they don't sound the trumpet, how shall the people in the city know that there is a war that's happening? Not the Bible says, blow the trumpet in Zion. Let it be heard. You know what happens with the blowing of a trumpet? The trumpet gets blown when the people come in, when there's a battle about to take place. The trumpet gets blown in the middle of a battle to encourage people. And the trumpet gets blown at the end of a battle also to say that we've been victorious. As I blow this trumpet this morning, I want you to think about this trumpet as prayer. As your relationship with God and praying. Before the enemy comes and you see him at a distance, don't try and make your own plans. Pray. You know why we fail in the middle of the battle? We fail in the middle of the battle because we failed in our preparations the weeks before. If you and I will spend time praying before the trouble comes, when the trouble hits, you'll just keep praying into it. In the middle of your storm, blow the trumpet of prayer. Because God's the one that's going to help you. After you've won the battle, go down on your knees and blow that trumpet of prayer again and say, Lord, it's just you who took me through this, Lord. That way you encourage yourself in the Lord. Amen. Lord, help me blow it properly. Sound the trumpet of prayer. Let it be heard in your house. Let it be heard in your car. Let it be heard in your lunchtime. Let it be heard all the time. Blow the trumpet of prayer. Because it's the biggest way I know to encourage yourself in God. In your prayer time, you quote the scriptures that God has given you. You quote those prophecies. And you stand against the discouragement. 
The prayer that sounds like a trumpet, I want to tell you, it's like a knife that cuts through the discouragement that the devil's bringing against you. It's the greatest weapon you have, the word of God and prayer. And you put them together and pray the word. <laughs> Enemy can't stand against that. And God is using your situations to develop you in himself. He hasn't brought you to the middle of the sea to drown you. He hasn't brought you to the battle to be slaughtered. He hasn't brought you to the circumstance to be overwhelmed. But He's brought you there so that He can give you the victory. Amen. Amen. We can please stand. I'll ask Brother Ruan and Maria to come forward. As we close, I want to quote the scripture. It says, that Without faith, without trust, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists. Listen, and that He is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek Him. Amen. Without faith it's impossible to please God. Amen. So we need to encourage ourselves in the Word of God, in prayer, and with fellowship amongst each other. Encourage yourself that God will carry you through. And that you know that when you pray, He hears you. And the Bible says, if you know He hears you, you've already received what you've asked for. That He's a good God, a loving God. A God that wants to prosper you and to do good to you. And that He will carry you through. Amen. We can close in prayer right there where you are. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. My Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, that in, this, in the story that we saw of Hezekiah, we can see that there's a development of Hezekiah himself. From self and from having others intercede for him to himself trusting in God and asking God. Lord, we see in the story the way the enemy comes against us with a big show and with lying little voices. But that, Lord, prayer cuts through all of that. That we must keep our trust and hope and faith in you because you want to use us. But this enemy wants to discourage us so much that we become unusable. Lord, I, I want to be used of you for your kingdom. Lord, in no way are we perfect people, perfect men or perfect women. Lord, situations and circumstances can get us down sometimes. But you are the God who's never failed us. You've never let us down. Through every battle you've been there, through every giant I've faced, you've been there. Lord, through every circumstance, you've been there. Lord, when David let go of that sling, your power took the rock and put it through the giant's head. Lord, I think of that sling of David as prayer. He just spun it and let go and you did the rest. Lord, if we'll just pick up that sling of prayer and swing it for you, swing it in your name, Lord, then you'll take the rock and put it through the giant's head for us. Lord, help us when the discouragement comes, when the big show comes and the little lying voice comes, that we can say we trust our God. Lord, I want to close with this. Because, Lord, in one night... You sent one angel into the camp of the Assyrians. In one night, 120,000 were killed and they lay dead. That when the sun came up the next morning and they looked over the walls of Jerusalem, there were nothing but corpses lying on the ground. Lord, you sent one angel. One, Lord. Lord, your word says that the angels, plural of the Lord, encampeth around about them that love you and fear you and serve you. Lord, we trust you. No matter what storm, no matter what giant, Lord. No matter what happens, Lord. You have our best at heart. And Lord, you will protect us and look after us. And I want to thank you for that in Jesus' name. That, Lord, we can have our faith and our hope and our trust in you this morning. And we thank you for it. Lord, I pray... For every person in this church who might be facing a giant now, who's going through a storm and a situation, my Lord and my God, you're still the one that walked upon the waters. You're still the one that said, peace be still, and the storm had to stop. You're still the one that pushed aside the stone and rose from the grave. You're still the one that ascended into heaven that led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. You're still the one that's seated on the right hand of the throne. You are Lord. You were the lamb that was slain, but now you are the lion of Judah that's taken every chain of darkness and broken it. Lord, you came as a lamb, but you're coming back as a lion. Lord, you're not the lamb coming, but the lion. All power and authority and dominion is yours. And Lord, we put our faith and hope and trust in you. No matter the storm, no matter the giant, no matter the situation, you are the maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. And we will put our trust and hope and faith in you. We thank you, Lord, for all the battles you've already taken us through, Lord. And Lord, for all the ones that lie ahead, that you will walk with us and carry us through. Thank you, Lord, for that two-edged sword of the word. Thank you, Lord, for that shield of faith. 
Thank you, Lord. You said you'll never leave us nor forsake us. We put our faith and hope and trust in you. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Lord, I want to close with the scripture. You said, he who has already given us his only begotten son, how much more shall he not give us all things that pertain to this life?